And thank you for joining this website hosted by TechSoup, uh, presented by Tap Network. Today, our topic is, I'm going to say this real slow, inclusivity essentials, creating accessible websites for nonprofits. I'm going to show you how you can engage. Somebody has already turned on the closed caption, but if you need the closed caption, go ahead and type on that. CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you will get the email with the video replay and the slides by tomorrow. And this is being recorded. So as I said, you're gonna get the re video replay. If you have a question, please type your questions in the q and um, Feel free to type them in the chat. Um, there's an awesome team here and they're very quick at grabbing those questions and seeing those questions. So as you're coming in, a lot of people were putting in um, where they're from, and do they feel like their website is accessible? I'm going to tell you about one new feature we here at we have here at TechSoup, and that is Quad. I'm going to be dropping a link about Quad here in just a moment. And basically, it's a community that that you can have peer-to-peer -peer interaction with, and so much more. Again, I'm going to drop the link, and when you get this slide, you'll be able to click on all these hyperlinks and be able to go to it directly. So I'm going to turn this over to Cal. Cal, thank you so much for your patience, and have a great webinar. Great. Thanks, Aretha. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Just a quick agenda of what we're going to cover today. We're going to go through a uh, quick background on who we are here at TAP Network. Um, what is web accessibility? What does this mean? Uh, why it matters? We're going to share some common tools, a couple solutions, and then we're going to hold this, uh, hold some time at the end for Q&A. So as we know, we're going to have a lot of questions that come out of this. Um, one thing we just want to make sure that you know we're, we're clear on, um, the information we're presenting today is certainly not legal advice. Um, but there, you know, there will there will be probably some some questions and things that come out of this about about the legality of this. You know, what might be required for you all as an organization uh, or from a web standpoint. Um, just some quick background on our, your two hosts today, myself, and I'm joined by John Hill. Um, my background is more in the like marketing application development space. We started this company, Tap Network, in 2012. Uh, we're a mission driven marketing and technology agency serving primarily nonprofit and government organizations. Um, so hyper aware and hyper focused on you know accessibility for those organizations and the constituents as well. Um, as I said, I'm joined by John today. John runs our, our all of our web projects here at TAP Network. So uh, he's got his hands on or in um, any project that comes across our plate. And so also very versed and, and focused on, on the accessibility um, for ourselves and for our clients. Um, our organization works with uh, com or our company works with organ organizations of all different sizes. You see everything from, you know, small organizations to big green energy, clean energy organizations, all the way up to companies like Denso, CSC, and Nonstop Health. And we also work locally in the community here with, with a very community focused and, and mission driven focus with organizations like many that we see calling in today on this call. Uh, again, anything from, you know, uh, local foundations to boys and girls clubs and, and kind of everything in between. How we can help, uh, we'll go through this a couple of times today. You probably have been on webinars with us before you've seen this, but um, if you go through TechSoup's website and you see the website services, the, the develop the marketing services, that's actually us. You know, we're, we're the, the the company behind the scenes that, that are delivering those services and, and the I, I hope to, the quality services um, on behalf of TechSoup. And we what that means is we can we can do everything kind of from strategy, creative branding to custom application development paid media, e-commerce, um, and and really anything in between. So if you think marketing, you think technology, um, that's really right, right in our wheelhouse. And I'll turn it over to John to kick the, the, the bulk of the presentation off. All right, thanks, Kyle. So we're gonna start with the poll question. So in the chat, you guys can answer A, B, C, or D. Question is, how important do you think website accessibility is for your nonprofit organizations? A, very important. B, important, C, somewhat important, or D, not important. All right, I see it firing off already. A, 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 C, I see a C, some A, some Bs. A lot of A's, I like it. All right, so it looks like we're kind of in the A, B, and C sort of area. Perfect. Hopefully by the end of this, we'll get you all to an A. Uh, so we're going to start with the introduction to website accessibility. So 
let's get started with kind of the big question, why does it matter? Uh, the A number one thing is everyone, regardless of ability, deserves equal access to information and services provided by nonprofits. I think we can all agree to that. Um, so as you can see on the slide, according to the CDC, one in four Americans has some sort of disability. And that's a huge portion of the population that we have to consider when designing a website. So think of it this way. By making your website accessible, you can reach a much wider audience. So ignoring accessibility can lead to exclusions and missed opportunities to connect with those who need the support the most. Ultimately, prioritizing accessibility is essential for nonprofits to fulfill their missions and make you know, meaningful impacts. Uh, so as we move forward today, just keep that in mind, you know, how, um, how can we be doing more to reach more people and make it easier for them to learn? So now let's move on to where this all comes from. understanding accessibility guidelines. Now that we understand why it matters, let's kind of delve into understanding the guidelines. So at the forefront, these guidelines are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, or WCAG, which were developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, known as W3C. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, and these guidelines serve as um, the most widely accepted standards for web accessibility. They kind of give us a framework for creating inclusive experiences that cater to uh, all users, regardless of their abilities. And it's not just about meeting the legal requirements, it's about ensuring that your websites are accessible for everyone. You know, we'll let you guys um, explore the finer details at your own pace. They're both linked here in the slides that will be available to you guys afterwards. Um, but overall, these guidelines outline best practices for addressing various accessibility challenges. And I know I keep saying that accessibility makes it better for users with disabilities, but in truth, following these guidelines makes it better for a better user experience for everyone overall. It only enhances your website and makes um, finding and navigating your website easier. So on the next slide, we're gonna jump into uh, the four principles. Uh, so let's break down these four principles. They are the four core principles represented by the acronym POR. We've got perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Some of these might be confusing right now, but by the end of it, it'll kind of all start to make sense. So just stick with me. Uh, first, we've got perceivable. So this is the emphasis that information and um, user interface components must be presentable to users in a way that they can perceive. So that's ensuring that content is accessible through various senses like sight and hearing. Um, operable, here we have uh, focus on making sure that user interface components and navigation are usable. Understandable, uh, so users should be able to comprehend the content and functionality of a website without confusion. And then robust. Lastly, this principle is about making sure that digital content can adapt and remain accessible across different platforms and devices. Um, so now that we've kind of gone over what accessibility is and why it's important, the principles, let's kind of dive into some of the more common challenges you might see on your website. And I'm not going to go over all of these in uh, detail, but first we've got uh, lack of alt text. Images with alternative text can make it really hard for people who rely on screen readers to access content um, and know exactly what they're looking at on a page. So providing descriptive alt text ensures that users can understand the purpose and context of images. And we'll be going into this more later. Um, another one, which I think somebody had brought up in the chat was um, uh, color contrast. So inadequate color contrast or color contrast can make it difficult for uh, people to see or read um, elements especially people with visual impairments, unclear navigation, you know, complex or confusing navigation structures can hinder users from finding that information easily. Um, Non-responsive design is another big one. Uh, if your website's not optimized for different screen sizes or devices, it could be challenging for individuals and um, to find stuff. Uh, yes, these slides will be sent out afterwards. Uh, other things include inaccessible forms, not being able not having those labeled properly, multimedia accessibility, videos without caption or audio, typography, small text, uh, makes it difficult to read, um, inaccessible documents like PDFs. If uh, somebody's using a screen reader and the documents aren't properly labeled, they don't understand what that is. So uh, these are a lot of things that if your site wasn't originally built with accessibility in mind, will take some time to fix. 
So now that we know what some of the common accessibility struggles are, we're going to dive deeper into some of the tools and tips for making this better. I'll hand that off to Kyle. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, John. Um, so John said some, some kind of practical accessibility tips and tools, um, some things that you guys can start doing today or make sure you're on the lookout for um, as you're building or up updating your existing or upcoming website. Uh, we'll start here with another poll question. So which accessibility feature do you find most challenging to implement on your website? Is it A, which would be alt text or text alternatives for images? B, which would be keyboard accessibility, so the ability for people to navigate through with a keyboard? Um, C, color contrast, and we already know that some of you have already said that. We're seeing that start to pop up in the chat. Or D, heading structure, so organizing content with the right H1, H2, and so on tags. Or we kind of use it. Oh, yeah, ease all the above, everything, which I <laughs> see a few of you. Um, typically, what we see is like the most challenging is, is often um, either color contrast or keyboard accessibility um, because that's it's probably not as readily thought of. Um, so keyboard accessibility is the ability to like navigate a, a website with just with a keyboard. So without the use of a mouse um, or, or other kind of input tool. And that would be like, you know, going, that would be ensuring that as you're navigating the website, if you use a tab key or use the arrow, you're able to get to the next section in a logical format or logical order. So you go from the top to the bottom and you, you navigate through a form and things of that nature. A lot of times, um, you know, when websites are built, they're not built with that in mind, specifically with that in mind. Same thing with color contrast. A lot of times, the brand branding and style of a co of an organization don't aren't measured through the color contrast. Um, so it's it's hard to uh, it's like kind of hard to go back and fix that after it. So like if you know if your colors are they don't meet that that minimum criteria, and that's on your website now, that's you know used throughout your marketing materials, and then you realize, oh wow, this doesn't meet the the minimum criteria of like four and a half to one or whatever the contrast ratio needs to be, um, it might be, you know, it might be hard to, to update or to, to fix that. So um, just some, some, some background on, on when you're thinking about how you're update, how to fix these websites or how to, how to fix your website or how to, to build your website. Um, we like to think of this from the format that like Excel accessibility should not be a feature of your website. So it shouldn't be, Hey, you know the keyboard navigation um, is is a feature of our website. Your website should be built so that it is accessible, and accessibility is kind of by default, right? Um, so you often hear that like you know accessibility is not a feature, right? So it's not something that we it's not like we have to add this on afterwards. It's it's it should be designed in the beginning. So we we like to design with empathy in mind, so you don't have to go back and redesign or rearchitect that in the future when you're building this. You know when you build it, um, you know using the right alt text when you build it with the right um, hierarchy of, of headings and things of that nature, you won't have to go back and and, and fix it or plug the holes. Um, it's also nice because it has SEO, performance, and user experience impacts as well. So it, these aren't just, uh, we'll keep saying this, I'll keep saying the word accessibility probably too many times today, but you'll hear me say, it. when you talk about accessibility, um, it's not just to meet those, those like the users with, with uh, you know, maybe a visual impairment or um, or a screen uh, screen reader or something of that nature. It's it's designed to be accessible, as John said, for everyone. And search engines, things like Google and Bing, they know that they can tell like when your website's coded correctly. They also give preference to the websites that are more accessible because they know that they are not only a good source of information, but they're also they want to be a good source of information and a good resource for anyone, regardless of um, you know disability. Same thing for the user experience. It's it's this is for optimizing user experience. Sure, if you follow all of the, you know, the requirements of accessibility kind of to a T, you could make a site that's so very accessible and it's not visually appealing. It's not something someone wants to navigate. So it's it's important to sort of to really blend blend the uh, blend those two. But you know, with, with that um, kind of underpinning, and then also thinking beyond the website. So. If you think about excessive, if we just stick to the color example, uh, you know, if you have like a dark color over a slightly darker color, which has, you know, a, a, a not, a, not, not the right contrast ratio on your website, you probably have that in other places as well. It might exist in emails that you sent out. It might exist in print material. And if it's hard to, it's hard for someone to see that on a website, if that contrast is, you know, doesn't work with someone who has color blindness or someone who has a visual impairment, 
on the web, it's probably the same way offline. So we also want to make sure that you know, with your brand, with your organization as a whole, you're thinking about accessibility sort of across the board. So some tips for creating those accessible websites. Um, the first is, this is probably all foreign, but using semantic HTML elements to create a clear and structured layout. So that's when someone's coding up the website or if you're using a, you know, a page builder, oftentimes that they'll kind of have this built in like Wix or Squarespace would, would typically have um, the right HTML structure. But if you are doing this you know, on your own or doing this from scratch, just making sure that you're using the right structure to provide that right layout. And that's things like having headers, the right sections, the, and then the footers, like the main body section, the footers, uh, and then and then any kind of combination of that as you're as you're going, um, using the color contrast to make sure text and image are easy to read. So with those people with with, with impairment, so that the text stands out from the pages it should, um, so that the image stand, stand out as well. Um, as we talked about using keyboard accessibility, so that anything that's supposed to be a navigational element or a menu can be uh, navigated through with the keyboard, with through the arrow keys, with the tab keys. Um, we like to regularly review and update that your website to, so that it keeps that accessibility. So, you know, these, these standards change over time, technologies change over time, um, features change over time, and a lot of, you know, the content and things like that on your website will also often change as well. So making sure when you're adding new blog posts or adding new pages or things like that, that you're, you're keeping, um, you're keeping accessibility in mind as you go. Uh, and then lastly is educating and training your team. So if there's other people that you're bringing in, if you've got interns, if you've got, you know, someone else uh, internally that's um, that's updating your website, if you bring on new developers or a new outsourced resource or something like that, make sure that they understand the best practices in general, but also the ones that you commit to and follow as part of your organization. Some additional considerations on this, um, you know, we, we, we mentioned this earlier, but you can see by from CDC's map or CDC's um, data collection that they say that one in four adults in the US has some type of disability. So if you just think about the people you could be excluding by not focusing on accessibility, uh, you know, you could see how you're alienating a good chunk, you could often alienate a good chunk of your audience. And oftentimes, you know, nonprofits specifically are working with people with some type of disability or um, that might be in a different, an underserved community or something like that, which might not, you know, accessibility is not just about when I keep saying abilities or disability or something like that. It's not just about people that have a disability. It's also accessibility for people on, on slow internet connections, on different devices, um, on things of that nature. So some other things to keep in mind. So being sure that all of your links and all of your form inputs have like descriptive text on them. So when someone's filling out a form, you want them to know what, they're supposed to put in that field, how you want them to format what they put in that field and whether or not that field is required. Um, that's probably kind of common sense if you're just, if you can visibly, visually see that on a page where it just says required, um, but you'd be surprised at how often, um, you know, forms are built in a way that when someone's visiting it from a screen, uh, from a, maybe a mobile device or from a screen reader or with a screen reader that it doesn't, it's not readily apparent that, that that field is, you know, an email field, it might just be tagged as like input one. So you don't know what that might be, or it might say, um, it might not tell them it's required. Um, probably something you, you may have heard or may not be familiar with is, but not opening links in new windows. A, a lot of times you'll see people, they want to keep you on their website. So when they, when you click on a link, it takes you out to another page. Um, that's not the best practice, especially for accessibility. It can certainly be confusing when someone's like, why, why did I click the link and on, you know, on the screen or on the screen reader, I'm still on the same page. Nothing else has changed. Um, Cause in that, from that experience, it's, it's, they would need to navigate outside of the application they're in or outside of the tab they're in or something like that. Uh, and there's ways around, you know, kind of doing the best practices for this. Having a skip to content link is also nice um, to have. So this is again, goes usually with screen readers, but this just gives the ability for like all that fluff that's at the top of the page. That's more just abstract. Oftentimes um, giving people who are visiting that site from a screen reader or from a, a accessible device, the ability to just go to the content that's important to them so that they don't have to read through all the navigation and things like that. Um, really important. So this is, this is not just from web accessibility. This is for how you structure your content in general making sure when you're doing that, that you are using uh, the right heading bags, the right bold, like bolding words that are important, italicizing words that you want to put emphasis on, 
and making sure that there's, a, there's a, you know a, a, the right structure there. So like when you think about that, that would be like the H1 tag is first, like the main heading. Below that would be H2, H3, and so on. You don't want to skip around from like H1 to H6 um, or something. Um, always look at using tools so you you know improve grammar. So using things like Grammarly or just basic spell check, um, being sure that your audience uh, who especially is just reading this content is you know the grammar is correct, the spelling is correct. Um, using descriptive links, so sites, buttons, things like that. They're just like click here, learn more. Like that's great from like a visual standpoint to draw your eye to that but you want to make sure that you're, you're providing context around that link um, or you're giving it some like code behind the scenes to tell them the screen reader what to expect there so a good link would be like you know at this url or you know click this to take you to where we are trying to go to not just click here uh, and you also want to also want to avoid directional language so on pages on a website, it might, you know, on a website, on a desktop, it might say, see below. And that's what you're, you're telling someone who's, you know, visiting that site from a desktop to see below. But then once they, on their screen reader, below might not be below. I might be somewhere else. Same thing like on the left of this page, on a mobile device, left and right might become top and bottom. So be careful when you're using that actual language in a page as well. Um, on the topic of mobile accessibility, so on, on, on a, the mobile device specifically, uh, be sure that your your website is accessible on those smaller screens. That's things like making sure that when a screen resizes, it's responsive. Make sure the text resizes accordingly to the screen. Things like images would want you want to resize as well. Um, so optimizing your website and for like mobile accessibility is really going to help even propel you even further um, for accessibility as a whole. Um, think about how touch gestures and interactions for people who like how you're requiring touch gesture touch gestures um, from people on a mobile device how that affects people who might not have the ability to to touch the screen or who not might not be navigating uh, in that format uh, and then a good pr practice is just to test your website on a bunch of different mobile devices and screens to make sure it works you know for all users or for for you know for the com a common user as well. And I'm just gonna keep going here. I feel like I'm I'm getting a lot out there. And I do see some some questions start to flow in. So please feel free to add those to the chat um, as they do come up. Um, we talked a little bit about about adding text alternatives to 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 pictures, um, but there's text alternatives not just specific to a photo. Um, anything with an image, an icon, videos, buttons, anything that would convey meaning um, or would be interactive should have some text alternative. So. If it's going to be functional on your website, if it's going to be something that someone would be interacting with, or um, you know, someone with no accessibility concerns would be expected to see or use, it should have a text alternative behind it too. And that text um, should describe the image for like a screen reader, um, like or if like it's a slow connection or or a, a poor connection, it would also help describe that image for over that over that connection. So sometimes I'm sure you've all been to a website and the picture won't load, but the, but the content will, and it'll say like image one dot JPG. And like, so you have no idea what's supposed to be there, but if it has the best, the, the right practice is to describe what's in that image. So if it says, you know, uh, man playing with a, kicking a ball with a boy on the field or something like that, if that, that should add context to the rest of the page. If it's, you know, if it's about something like that, like getting out there, um, in the, in the, into nature or spending time with your kids outside or things like that. Then you would have that that feed, that image, and then it would describe what that is. And if it doesn't load, you would know it's supposed to be there. Um, it should contain just enough information so it describes the image without it being like too lengthy. So you would write the whole story about the guy kicking the ball with his kid outside. It would just tell you who's in there. Um, it should be between a couple words, a few words, and a short sentence or two, but not much longer than that. But it should be descriptive. It shouldn't just be like guy, ball, kid, field. Um, when those images are used as a link to another page, you also want to describe where that link, that image link is going to take them. So like if, if it's a button for a button, for example, you'd say, you know, button to take you to tapnetwork.com, for example. Um, the image, alt text for like images, like charts, graphs, things like that um, should be, should have a link to a text only description of that image. And it should have a description of what's in there as well. 
But if it's very complex, this you should also offer an, an alternative to that. So if it's like during the comparison of of number of people kicking balls with their kids year over year, like and they have it from 2000 till now and all the all the data points on there. If it's just a graph and you don't have all that, you're not going to be able to shove all that in the alt text. So you're going to want to give them a link to the underlying data so they could see so they could read what that would be. Um, and then if the image alt text is blank, then the image gets skipped over by screen readers. So these are like, if you are intentionally doing that, those are with things like decorative images, like background images, um, icon graphics, like little things like little I for information, or a lot of times like the Facebook logo or Twitter logo, I think those little logos, those can be decorative images. Um, but just have that in mind that that's, that's the, the process that's going to happen. So if a screen reader reads a page, there's no alt text for that image. If that image is supposed to be part of that page or in context on that page, nothing's there and you're going to lose the context. You're going to lose that, um, that reader. So just some examples. So again, we're, uh, everybody will get these slides afterwards. So you can see, um, the correct versus incorrect thing. So the top example shows alt text of people working and collaborating at computers on desks in our downtown Houston open floor plan office. Right, it's so a very descriptive of what it is. Probably for like a, a company or a um, you know like an agency or something like that to show you know who they are, who might be there. On the right, you see someone who just wrote people working. Right, it could be anywhere. It could be any type of people working in any type of environment. So it's not descriptive enough. Um, and then we gave examples here of like alt text on icons where you would just leave those things blank. Where it's like financial aid, scholarships, the alt text on those things. Would, wouldn't exist because we do have text below them that describes it. So it's really just like a con. Um, and I won't read each one of these things to you. Uh, the other one that we want to we keep in mind, was, and, and you all said you were having some challenges with, would be color contrast. So this is really important. We already talked about like the reasons why, um, but like poor color contrast makes it hard for people to read um, with people with low vision or color blindness. Um, the goal is like the standard really should be you know 4.5 to 1 is that contrast ratio and you can see some examples of low contrast high contrast what works what doesn't work some things might be like wow this looks like i could really easily read that like the maybe the, the lighter red with the white over it might be very easy to read for for most of us um versus the the yellow and white is obviously harder to read for most people as well but once it comes to you know when it comes to that um that minimum ratio it actually is hard or, or impossible to read that that 3.9 to 1 um, especially with the larger text um, or with, with smaller text, sorry. Um, there are standards that say like three to one for large text. So if it's those different sizes, then it's okay. Uh, that usually would be like for header images and things like or header text or, or larger title text. Um, but we just like to follow the practice of 4.5 to one for everything. That way we don't, there's no kind of question about it. If people resize their screens, they're not going to, it's not going to break outside of that either. Uh, and we just recommend you check that contract contrast for text and interactive elements like buttons, links, things like that as well. So even though it might not be text, it might be like a button or an icon or something like that over top of a color. We want to keep that same contrast ratio um, difference. This is where it gets really, um, really nerdy and confusing uh, if you don't know what some of this stuff is. Uh, another way to overcome a lot of this is using what's called ARIA. ARIA is Accessible Rich Internet or Application Markup. So it's information for people with screen readers and other um, accessible devices to better understand those elements on a page. So we've just given some examples. There's a ton you can do here, a link in here that shows you all these different ARIA states. But as we talked about before, when there's a, um, you know, like a link in this example, we say, click here. So the screen reader would say, you would just see four more information about us, click here, but it doesn't really tell the screen reader, what clicking here is going to get them. If you use the ARIA label, it says for more information about us, it's going to tell you to click here. And it's, going to, it's basically telling them that's going to take you to the about, the ARIA label is about us. That means that so that the screen reader knows that that's going to take them to the about us page. Um, the caveat to this is if you can use a native HTML element, so something like a label or um, you're just text, um, you would use that with the semantics and the behavior that are like already required or built in, use that instead of an ARIA tag, but ARIA tag is useful when you can't use that. So in, in our, in my example earlier, if it said click, if the whole link was click here to go to our about us page, that
that would be sufficient because it explains where the person's going, the person that's clicked it, but the screen reader is going to know they're going there. But if you don't use all that in the link, then you can use the ARIA tags to, to overcome that. And I can take a break now and hand it back to John. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, yeah. So we got another poll question coming in. What motivates you the most to prioritize website accessibility in your nonprofit organization? A, social responsibility, B, legal compliance, C, user experience, D, impact and reach, E, all of the above. Seeing a lot of all of the above. That makes sense. Also seeing a lot of C's and A's. mostly seeing a lot of all of the above, which I'd agree. All right, so now let's talk about getting your website accessible and maintaining that. So maybe as you've picked up by now, creating accessible websites is not just like a one-time task, but rather an ongoing commitment. Um, as you add or change content on your site, you need to keep accessibility in mind and make changes with it. So things like monitoring and evaluating regularly, uh, you know, conducting regular uh, audits to help identify areas of improvement, staying updated, um, keeping up to date with the latest accessibility standards and guidelines. Uh, as Kyle said earlier, you know, technology and standards evolve, so do the rules. Uh, collecting user feedback, uh, commitment to continuous improvement. Accessibility is an ongoing process that does require continuous learning and improvement. Um, so embracing a culture of that is super important. Um, and with that said, um, providing training and development. So offering opportunities for professional development um, in, in accessibility for your team is also really crucial. Um, and a great way to, to take all this is to commit and uh, commit to accessibility improvements in an accessibility statement. Um, so now that we've covered kind of the strategies for improving accessibility, let's talk about the importance of an accessibility statement on your site. Um, an accessibility statement serves as a declaration for your organization's commitment to accessibility. Uh, it demonstrates to your users that you prioritize inclusivity. Uh, an accessibility statement provides transparency about the current level of accessibility on your website. You know, it informs users about uh, the accessibility features available and any areas um, that may still need improvement. Uh, in addition to all the above, an accessibility statement can also ensure uh, legal compliance and even potentially provide protection against litigation. It shows that your organization takes accessibility requirements seriously. Uh, it also is just a valuable resource for users, uh, you know, especially those with disabilities. It provides kind of guidance on how users can navigate and interact with your website's accessibility features. Um, additionally, it's just good for SEO. You know, more unique content is always good for SEO. Um, and as we wrap up this kind of portion of the talk, we just want to do, um, leave you with a list of some links um, that talk more about accessibilities and some tools. I saw some people in the chat already request some of these things. Um, so right here is a great resource for you guys in terms of uh, different websites that you guys can look at for uh, color contrast checkers. Um, Web aim is a great resource for a lot of re uh, tu tutorials and stuff. Um, the Ally Project and web accessibility tutorials, again, step-by-step -step tutorials, um, and the accessibility statement generator, which then you could use on your website. Awesome, I'm actually gonna go back one one slide here. Um, as, as John mentioned, so um, these links will be provided. These are just some examples of links that, that, um, that are available, tools that are available for you all. Um, after this, but there's any there's a number of other ones out there that are um, that kind of meet these same criteria. So you, you go look for you know somebody that's doing um, website accessibility guidelines, a website accessibility checker, 
accessibility statement generator. You can obviously generate your or create your own as well. Just talking about like how you you commit to accessibility. So these are just some some, some tools or some tips that we would provide. Um, and then once you've done that, I uh, just want to give the opportunity for how we can help tap. So like, what do we do here? As we said, you know, we develop a ton of websites. We we build with accessibility in mind. We can certainly, you know, if you guys run one of those reports, um, we can we can help you kind of navigate through that. Um, we're also launching an accessibility product or a few products and offerings through TechSoup. They're not available in the catalog yet. So we've got a few things we're putting out there right now. Um, quick, easy way to get in touch with us. As I mentioned earlier, if you just go to TechSoup's homepage or any page on their site, go to services. Uh, either the website services or the digital marketing drop down basically takes you to almost the same place uh, with a form where you can reach out to us for a consultation. Um, we do have a, a product in the catalog right now that's called, it just says, oh, it's called a website wellness consultation. We're honoring that as our website accessibility con consultation. When you feel, when you go and check out with that, just make sure you mention to us that this, that you actually want the accessibility consultation, not the website wellness. We'll, we'll kind of combine it all into one, but that way we make sure we focus our, our conversation and our feedback to you. So you'll have a link to this uh, in a document to get that consult. From there, we also do, you know, full custom website development. So strategy, content and design, make sure the site structure is right. We make the right recommendations. We'll even build that custom website for you. Uh, we'll do the development. So the best practices, following best practices, build on WordPress, uh, develop so it is accessible, user-friendly, easy for you all to, to update on your own, um, you know, if, if we were to go away. Uh, and then we'll QA, test it and launch it. And it can be, can stay supportive of you on an ongoing basis. Um, and with that, I just wanted to open this up. I know we've got a little bit, a little bit of time left, so I saw a bunch of questions rolling in. So I'm going to open this up for questions now. Um, as we mentioned originally, you can either you can put that in the chat um, so everyone can see it. Uh, I see a few here in the Q and A um, that might not be able to be seen by everyone, but I'll start to address those. I'll, so I'll read those out and either I'll answer them or I can hand them over to John um, if it makes sense too. So um, someone asked what to use instead of see below, uh, just just not using directional text, it, like just removing the directional text in across the board is the is the best practice. Um, so you would just lead right into it. So you, you could admit it all together where you could write or you could put, you know, on this page, something like that. You just don't want to say below, above, to the left, to the right, something like that, because you never know where it's going to appear um, either in, in line or in context when someone has a screen reader. Um, a couple of people asked about the tool to find the color contrast ratio. I can share this, I'll share this in the, um, in the chat, but it's also in this document, uh, as well. Once we share it with you all. And again, there's a number that are out there. If you go to like w3.org or WCAG, um, they have one. I know accessible web has one accessibleweb.com has one. Um, and then you can, you can put in your colors. Um, you can put in. Uh, like any you know combination that you're planning to do it just to see where it is and it's like kind of cool at least with accessible webs you can move the little color slider around and it'll update in real time so you can see if it's if you met that that contrast ratio or not um linda's asked we have an existing website that has been tweaked for accessibility over the last 10 years we have a long way to go to check all the pages it has several pages links etc is it best to start over instead of retrofitting i i i would probably say yes but also it's, it's sometimes it's six one half does the other it depends it really depends how the site's built so you know if the site has a common header common footer and a lot of the same templates sometimes you can make an up you can make a few updates or you know a number of updates but to get you there um but if the design is a little dated if the contrast ratios are out if there's different if there's if every page is built differently um it's probably going to be just as big of a lift to start over from scratch as it would not scratch but start over as it would be to go through, find all the issues, and then update those issues. Um, if you run, if you run a report, for example, um, or you have a report run, and, and it's if it's manually done to review all of your to review your site for accessibility, um, we typically would tell would say we'd estimate estimate about an hour per task, so per re remediation issue. That doesn't mean like an hour per per. Um, per image that needs to be updated or alt text, something like that. But it's like, you know, if the header needs to be updated or if the footer needs to be updated or this button or this overlay or whatever, um, we probably estimate about an hour per per remediation item. And I think 
especially if it's kind of been pieced together over the years, you'd be surprised how quickly that 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 number of hours adds up um, on top of the time to manually review that uh, and go through it versus starting with a solid foundation from something that you know will be accessible from from day one that's going to have all of this in mind. It's built with this um, in mind. I think you might end up with a better better product, but I'm not I don't that's not to say that you couldn't kind of go back and retrofit it. Um, when it comes to alt text for event flyers, how much detail should we include? This is often a challenge, especially on social media. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the real right answer is, is to follow that that same sort of format that we talked about with the graphs. So where you would where you would have um, a, a text only cop version of that that would outline everything that's in there that wouldn't necessarily necessarily be in the alt text. You would provide that link as part of the alt text um, or a link to, uh, you know, the co content only um, so that that could be viewed by anyone, um, you know, with a screen reader or something like that. And that's like also just a, a good best practice in, besides that, in that example, it's a good pr best practice to, to not put text on top of images when that is that, that image needs to be functional. So a lot of times people you'll see with like a header image that has the text that's supposed to be in the header right on top as part of the image instead of, putting the text over top of it so it can be read. Um, that is where that starts to break down over time. Let's see how to determine what the color contrast ratio that we are using is. Uh, so you just use that color contrast checker uh, would be the right way and just pick the colors from your page, your current page. Um, our website uses an overlay to help with accessibility. It does provide an accessibility statement. What I'm wondering is, will this meet criteria for accessibility? Uh, oftentimes, that what, what that will do, it, it doesn't really necessarily meet the criteria for your website being accessible. It just makes your website accessible. So um, probably confusing, but that means that like your website is not going to be is not passing accessibility be, like the way it's built now. They would still need to use that that tool that access that overlay. So like UserWay has one of these, Accessibility has one of these. They're great tools. They're a great way to make your website accessible. It it does not. So there's a requirement for, especially usually government organizations, a lot of times membership organizations, as product organizations, e-commerce, things like that, that you have to make your website accessible. And the reason behind that is like, if you don't like, so let's say you provide membership for a hundred dollars to people if it's not accessible for someone that doesn't have, you know, can't is using a screen reader or something like that to buy the same thing that John, who might not need to use a screen re reader, can buy, you're discriminating against him, right? Same thing from a government standpoint. If you're providing government assistance, government resources, things like that, as part of the government or as part of a government organization, you, if with your site not being accessible without the use of another tool like an accessibility overlay or something like that you are now technically discriminating against that that other audience so you're not being you're not providing that resource so if that's the case then i would rec i would recommend making sure that your site i would certainly recommend making sure that your site's accessible without the use of that overlay but the use of the overlay will make your site be accessible if that's not one of the require like a requirement of your organization um it's also not to say that like these these laws are changing again this is not legal advice these laws are changing all the time um, you know, from like 2016 till now, we've seen it change drastically to become more and more required. So it's not it's not a stretch to think that it, you know at some point any any publicly available site on the internet would be required to be accessible. Just like you know a lot of um, you know publicly publicly public spaces are also required for uh, to be accessible. The our staff loves to make content that contains text in Canva, put on our website as an image. Is there a way to improve the accessibility of these images with Canva or ARIA label? I've been recreating with the individual assets, but it's time consuming. Uh, it would be with the alt text and then and or with the ARIA label. Um, I, I think it's just you know putting putting that standard of best practice in place so that they are um, you know following those guidelines and they are making sure that there's a text version of that. Uh, so that you don't have to go back and recreate it on your own. Like if they could provide that with you, to you when you're um, when they turn it when they turn it over to be put up on the site. Uh, do you assist with web accessibility development on Squarespace, limited to WordPress? No, we can we can assist on you know on, on, we can assist with pretty you know at least direction on any on pretty much any platform. 
It's just the level, the level of work that we can actually do. So depending on how it's built on Squarespace or how it's built on these other platforms, we may, may or may not be able to actually implement the, the fixes, but that doesn't mean we couldn't recreate it, right? So like if it, maybe we won't be able to fix what's there now, but if we redevelop that piece or that page or whatever it is, there's, there's certainly a way we could um, get you to a, a level of accessibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my favorite. Uh, in general, how much does it cost to create a new accessible website? That that one is, is certainly, I, I if I had the answer to this, I would be a billionaire. Um, it's it it really depends on um, you know the amount of content, the level of design, how much we would have to do. Um, as we as you'd seen, like our custom uh, on the slides, like usually our our custom websites start about fifteen thousand dollars, and that's regardless of if you have the content or not already, if it's an existing organization or old one, and that's really um, I think you'll find if you look around, that's a very competitive rate for building. A, for custom a custom design that does take that is accessible that you know kind of checks all these boxes um, and has a bunch of is built on WordPress follows best practices and has like the features and functionality you would need so like having resources having a contact form tying into like a CRM database being mobile responsive um, but we've built sites that are you know we built sites for five thousand dollars we built sites for half a million dollars like they it, it really runs the runs the gamut so it kind of depends you know what you need typical brochure style site you could probably get in for you know, maybe even under ten thousand dollars if it's just a, you know much less if it's just a few pages uh and oftentimes like back to the earlier question like should we fix or 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 redo um it's the same answer there like if you have a three or four page website it's probably pretty easy to fix it you might not want to spend the time or money redoing it if you have a 200 page website it's probably going to take you a lot of time to go through all 200 pages it's probably it might be better for you to start over and decide like do i need all 200 of these pages is this you know meeting our goals are we doing what we need to do um and then let's redesign this so that we have a solid foundation and add pages back as we need to um is there something free that reviews your website and gives you an accessibility score and or what you should change in the old days or something called bob yep there's a number of these we actually i think there's actually one or two of these linked in this document um accessibility.com or accessibleweb.com both have something like this an automated score i would I, there's absolutely nothing wrong with going down that path it's a great start um i will tell you that it is an automated score so like it just if you pass all the automated scoring, that's great. That does not necessarily mean that it is 100% accessible because it, you know, you would, you do need someone to, um, you know, use a screen reader or use like assistive technology to really see if, if your website is accessible. There's also many times some false positives in some of those things where it'll tell you that this doesn't pass or this does pass. Usually it does, it's a doesn't pass thing, which isn't, um, isn't actually you know, part of the page or functional part of the page. Um, if we're creating a website, what platform is easiest, best to use to create an accessible website like Wix, Squarespace, et cetera? Uh, it depends on the depth, like the, the depth of the website, you know, and, and the, the functionality you need. We we certainly like, we, we stick pretty much almost primarily to WordPress because we have a lot of flexibility uh, in, in making accessible, there are millions and millions of WordPress themes out there that are certainly not accessible. There are plenty that are, though. Um, we would use a page builder called Elementor, which gives you a lot of flexibility in adding area labels and area label by and tags and things like that, and also are built out of the box with accessibility in mind, so it makes it better for you to, easier for you to set those things up and, and set those, you know, alt text and parameters like that. Okay. Still going through these. So I'm stealing your thunder here, John. Sorry. Um, what other kinds of accessibility issues should be considered in addition to visibility concerns? Uh, I mean, it's. I wouldn't say it's all. It's all about. It's not just visibility. It's input device input as well. So, like, you know, if you think of someone who doesn't have full use of, you know, both of their their hands or something like that, accessibility um, is also would be based on like bandwidth or connection. So connectivity is a huge. Um, element of accessibility. So especially in, in underserved communities where they might not have access to high speed internet, um, thinking about that that's why that's why things like alt text um, and and context to the and context and content are so important um, to engage with that. 
Um, uh, there's also, you know, there's certainly be the flip side of that. So if you, if you require like here, like audiology or something like that on your website, make sure there's a text component to that. So if they are have a hearing impairment, they're able to read what's supposed to be there. So things like closed captioning, that sort of stuff like that comes into play. Um, let me pick a few more here. Our website uses the US. I'm seeing some of the people have duplicated these, so thank you for putting them in the Q and A. Um, someone asked, uh, "Can you provide an example of the text over image to demonstrate which is more accessible?" Um, I I think we could we will add one to this slide or something like that to to show that. But let me see if I have one in here. Um, probably don't, but an example, I mean, this is actually not a bad example. So text over an image. So this, this text over this image would meet that same criteria of four and a half to one. So really dark over really light, right? So there's a, a, a stark contrast between the two. Um, but also thinking about like when you're putting that text over an image. So things like those automated readers aren't always going to catch this. If you have a text that like might be like they're dark to light, but the, the, I'm sorry, if you have a, an image that might go dark to light, so maybe one side's got like the sunshine on it or something like that, um, you're going to want to make sure that the text goes light to dark, right? The opposite, so that it over that background, it's going to fit, it's going to still keep that same kind of contrast ratio. Um, do you recommend using video description for videos? We do, but we recommend, and it from it's an accessibility requirement to to enable closed captioning to, to have a closed captioning uh, available for for videos or songs uh, as well. So, anything back to that that example of audiology. So, making sure that you uh, you enable that. There's any number of tools that can also do that for you. It doesn't mean you need to spend the time to sit there and type out every word that's in the video. You can run it through something like Otter.ai um, or a number of other AI tools that will create transcripts for you those videos, but it's important to have those uh, available. Um, do you find the color contrast checker features in programs like Adobe to be accurate with actual use? We we certainly use those when we design stuff in like Figma. We do, we certainly look at the, the contrast between, you know, foreground and background. Um, but we also, you also want to look at that stuff from, like a, from a brand level. So we'll typically have like a brand package. Uh, and you'll have the different colors that are available, when to use them, when not to use them. So it's sort of a best practice to follow. Um, is there a site can check sites in Chrome, Safari, et cetera, with responsive sizes? Uh, browser stack is one way to do that. It's not going to be automated for you, but it gives you the opportunity. There's like browser plugins that you can use, also browser plugins you can use that will we'll check them for you. Um, Um, do these website these recommendations for website care we're producing emails for mass audiences yes as we said like you know we do want to think beyond the website so even in powerpoint presentations anywhere where you're going to have um you know where, where someone could be in engaging with it um from an assistive technology device it's important to to think about accessibility uh, especially if you're like distributing distributing these through a website. So if you are, somebody asked about a flyer earlier. So if you're distributing that flyer, you know, making sure it's built in a way, like a PDF in a way that isn't just a flat image so that they can actually pull, they can actually read the text that's in that image if they have like uh, assistive technology um, or emails, same thing, like not embedding text or image in an email when you, when you don't have to. And if you do, it, it should certainly have the alt text uh, included with it. Um, somebody, uh, I think, elaborated on that question. So, closed caption does not have anything, any, anything with video descriptions. CC, closed caption for hearing impaired and video descriptions for blind. Yeah, exactly. So, I would stick with those because like the requirement is the closed captioning, uh, and then the description of what's in the video, just like it would be what's in the alt text, like what to expect in the video is, um, is, is important. But it's the, the, the auto, audio to text. Uh, that's the requirement. Uh, the sites check colorblindness. They don't. They do not check colorblindness because there's there's 
I, I forget the number. There's some crazy number of, of different types of color blindness, um, but it does check with, um, it does check for those contrast ratios, which are like, I would say, are supported, support those a lot of those different levels of color blindness. Um, someone asked, uh, there's a few more that popped up here. Uh, how do you find the best accessible WordPress themes? Um, I, I'm not, I don't have, we don't, we don't typically use themes. We develop these, we develop our own in-house. So we develop our own designs in-house and then put them on, uh, on WordPress. But uh, I know Google, I think sites like theme forest would have, um, or an elementor would have some of those those themes that are built with accessibility at the forefront. Uh, and then someone asked, uh, what is an accessibility overlay? That would be something like user way or accessibility, which would just, usually it's just like a, there will typically be an icon uh, on the page, like a floating icon at some point on the page um, that has the, like an accessibility icon. When you click on that, uh, it'll pull up uh, ways to make the site more accessibility. So it'll do things like to convert all the text to black and white um, or to read the right, meet the right contrast ratio, it will resize copy for you. It will, um, you know, reduce, remove all images. Uh, it'll remove like filler stuff. It, it, and you can set a lot of these things on the back end of that as well. Um, there's usually free versions and paid versions of those. So the paid versions obviously do a little bit more than the free ones too. Cool. Um, I really appreciate all the, the questions. There's some great questions that came through today. Uh, as Aretha said in the beginning of the call, um, you will all be receiving this um, this deck, which will have these links in it. But if you have questions in the meantime, uh, we, we as we kind of showed you, there's a, a you can get a hold of us um, just going through TechSoup site, just grabbing that drop down um, and reaching out. We'd be happy to help. Thank you all so much. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Day.